recently in um, when Rebecca and I were having devotions before our prayer. Uh, I call them devotions, but they might better qualify as many sermons. But um, uh, at any rate, God began to speak concerning intercession. And not necessarily my intercession, not my intercession, not the intercession that we were hopefully engaging in that night, but rather his intercession. And uh, I was very edified, and I just want to share with you some of the thoughts that God spoke to me, because in actuality, I understood the sacrifice of Christ in kind of a different light uh, as a result of that that night. Um, you know, sometimes it can feel as though everything is against us, and the enemy will support that anxiety. The enemy is more than happy to support that anxiety because he wants us to be overwhelmed. Do you understand that in the days in which we're living, the enemy's objective is that we be overwhelmed? That's his objective. However, we must remember that not only, you know, do we serve a Savior and a Lord, but we serve a high priest and a pastor. I don't mean pastor, a man upon earth. But Jesus Christ is our good shepherd. He's our good pastor. And a good pastor who is ever interceding for his sheep. Ever interceding for his sheep. In Romans 8.34 it says, Who is he that condemneth that is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who also maketh intercession for us? You know, Christ makes intercession for us. And just a brief survey, I mean, I'm sure you can go more into depth, just a brief survey. What do the scriptures say about the content of his intercession. What is the content? What is, it, what is he interceding for? What is he, what's his prayers for Frank? What are his intercessions for us? In one sense, you could say his death upon the cross intercedes for us, right? But I think this is a little bit more active than that. Because uh, later on in the message, we'll see the account where Jesus says concerning Peter, I've prayed for you. I prayed for you. And so I don't think it was confined to his three and a half years upon the earth. I believe Jesus continually prays for us. So what does the scripture say? Say, It says that he intercedes for salvation to the uttermost. Pastor wrote a book on salvation to the uttermost. I had a chance to teach it on TV some time ago in Corning uh, for the, the school. And I have to be honest with you, the book kind of transformed my life. But save to the uttermost... Salvation to the uttermost. Not just squeak across the line, but an abundant entrance. Salvation to the uttermost. It says also that he makes an intercession for us according to the will of God. Now we're going to look at verses in a moment. I'm just giving a rundown here. Intercession according to the will of God. I like that. At the end of my life, I want to fulfill the will of God. And so Christ is interceding for us according to the will of God. He is interceding for his people uh, for the iniquity of us all. We'll see in a moment we're going to end up in Isaiah 53. For transgressors he intercedes. And then it says the Spirit intercedes with groanings that cannot be uttered. You know, groanings that cannot be uttered. Groanings that cannot be uttered. I feel like (laughs) most of my prayers are like groanings that cannot be uttered. At least any more. And so I want to look at just a few of these uh, verses. And, and again, I'm going to be, bear in mind here, I don't want this to be uh, to wear everyone out. I want this to be edifying, and I want us to leave this morning with the sense that we have a faithful high pastor, high priest, who's interceding for our success. He's in our corner. Probably the most effective tool that the enemy has in his arsenal is to interfere between your knowledge that God wants you to succeed. Interfering with that knowledge that you know God wants you to be successful as a believer. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25, wherefore he's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You know, can you imagine 
uh, our Lord interceding for us. We saw, you know, we see in the life of Jesus, he, he goes, uh, as he's going to the cross, he goes into the garden and he, he uh, intercedes. We get a glimpse of what his intercession is like. In that instance, he sweat drops of blood. But he's praying that we would be saved to the uttermost. And, and by the way, you, you, you want, you're intelligent enough to understand that the enemy's intent is the antithesis, right? That we would not be saved to the uttermost. That he would impede it. That he would impede us from achieving that. But Jesus Christ intercedes for all of you that you'd be saved to the uttermost. To the uttermost. The word uttermost means completely, perfectly, utterly. That's my hope, my aspiration. And so he, Jesus Christ, is able to save them who come unto God the Father by him seeing that Christ ever lives to make an accession for those who come to God. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I like that that was added at the end, according to the will of God. You know, I I, I mentioned to you before, one of my own personal revelations that was given to me in heaven is that we aren't just judged on whether we've accepted Christ or not, but we're judged on how much of God's will has been fulfilled in our lives. Do we understand that? In the moments when we feel perhaps a slackening in our walk, when we feel perhaps uh, a little difficult to take another step, let's always bear in mind that we will be measured in eternity by what God's will and his plan for us was. But let's take it a step further than that. Let's also realize that God is interceding for us according to that will. You know, I, I I think that God lays a lot of checks down that we don't pick up if you get my meaning. I think he writes a lot of checks for us that we don't cash, is what I'm saying. He writes a lot of checks for us that we don't cash. He's ever interceding for us according to the will of God. Do you find yourself struggling to fulfill God's will for your life? Why not look for some of those checks that are being written? Oh God, where's the grace? Intercede for me. You know, it is not an uncommon practice for me as I stand before you and as I stand before the Lord. It's not an uncommon practice for me to sit in my Queen Anne's chair and say, Oh God, tonight, Lord, intercede for me. Pray for me, Lord. I don't trust the content of my own prayer. I don't even know how I should pray as I ought. And so I throw myself at your mercy and I say, Oh God, intercede for me. Intercede for me. What a comfort it is to me, by the way, when I do that. What a comfort I feel in my spirit when I say, Oh God, intercede. And so the Spirit of God knows the will of God and intercedes for us according to it. Our calling and the plan of God for our lives can be fulfilled because the Spirit is making intercession for us according to the will of God. We mentioned this already as well. Romans 8.26 Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. I got lots of infirmities. I don't know about you. I, as soon as I stumble out of bed, I'm racked with infirmity. <laughs> and they seem to be with me all the day. You know, my father, my for, poor father, uh, for the last 37 years, no, 30 some years of his life, uh, he suffered with painful arthritis. I mean, the type of arthritis where your joints begin to dissolve. And he said, he actually had a name for arthritis. He said, Arthur, Arthur's with me today. And everywhere he went, Arthur was with him. And he never could get free of Arthur. And, uh, you know, he did it to be as, as kind of his coping mechanism. But, you know, to break my heart, I thought, always suffering the infirmities and the afflictions. Well, there are infirmities that are just as painful that can't be seen by the naked eye. Infirmities that we have in spirit and infirmities that we have in the flesh. But the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered for our infirmities, for our weaknesses, for the things that we struggle with, can't quite seem to 
overcome things that dominate us, infirmities, afflictions, impediments. The Spirit of God is making an intercession for us. Helping us with our infirmities. Helping us with our infirmities. Now, I, I saw something in the Scriptures that I'll be honest with you, in my over four decades of being a Christian, I never saw before. And I dare say, because I didn't see it, I didn't appreciate that it was a thing. And I want to get into that now. I want to talk about the suffering of his soul. You know, we, we understand the suffering of his flesh. We understand the sweating drops of blood. We understand the piercing. We understand the humiliation. We understand the crown of thorns. And we understand all of that. But do we fully appreciate the suffering that entered into his soul? What does it mean to suffer in your soul? In one word, it's anguish. The suffering in your soul is anguish. Do you realize, and did I realize? No, I did not. That part of the sacrifice of Christ for our lives was the anguish that entered into his soul. That was part of the suffering. We'll see that clearly in Isaiah. It says exactly that. That God accepted the suffering of his soul as part of the atonement for our sin. And so when we, when we say that we have a faithful high priest who can easily be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, we're talking about a, a faithful high priest who knows what it's like to suffer anguish in his soul. And to bear the infirmities and the afflictions of his people. And to understand what it means to have anguish. Have you ever had anguish? Anguish in your soul. We can appeal to a spirit and to a God who understands what it's like to suffer terrible anguish. And something I had never really considered before, to be honest with you. God accepted the suffering of his soul as an offering for our sin. In fact, the fact of the matter is it was God who bruised him in the first place. What is the spirit of intercession? The spirit of intercession is defined for us in Isaiah 53. Pleading for us by the anguish in his own soul. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse 10. Let me read it for you. This is, of course, prophetic of Christ. And so we're getting an opportunity here to pull the curtain back, to pull the veil back for a moment and get an an idea of the suffering that Christ went through. Isaiah 53, verses 10 uh, to 12. In verse 10 it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. In other words, we're talking about the Father to the Son. When thou shalt make an offering, uh, excuse me, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Not his body, not his flesh, but the anguish of his soul was part of the, the reconciliation process. It was part of the atonement. It was part of Christ becoming a faithful high priest over his creation. God accepted the suffering of his soul as an atonement for our sin. Not taking away the physical suffering. But I think we do the sacrifice of this service if we only talk about the flesh. It was the anguish in his soul. And it says that the Father bruised him. And the Father created that anguish in his soul. And it was the Father who lives with the knowledge that he was the one who bruised the Son. You see the sacrifices that were made by the Godhead? For our success? He shall see... I'm continuing on in verse uh, 10 here. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And so he's the one who intercedes for us, and he's worthy to intercede for us because he knows what it is to have anguish in soul. Have you ever had one of those nights where you lay in bed and you toss and you turn and sleep is futile and maybe a decision is coming up or maybe a suffering is coming up or maybe some failure is about to be exposed or some uh, uh, you know shortfall in your life 
the anguish. Well, we have a great pastor who can understand, not the failure part you understand. We're not going to ascribe that to the Lord. But we have a faithful high pastor who's able to understand the anguish of our soul. In Isaiah 53, verse 11, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Isn't that an interesting verse? (laughs) As a father, my mission in life, as I understood it, was to alleviate the anguish of my children's soul. To somehow meet their need so that they didn't have to, you know, to go through certain sufferings. Certain sufferings, you know, you just, you have to go through. But the irony between the relationship and the father and the son and the relationship of us with our children is that the father accepted the sacrifice of the son in order to forgive the people who put him to death. I mean, (laughs) if somebody takes one of my children, God forbid, and sacrifices them, I'm not feeling warm thoughts towards them. In fact, they better be running really fast. But this is the irony of the sacrifice of Christ. And this sacrifice, you know, enables him to intercede for us. Do we appreciate the fact this morning that God intercedes for us? I'm very taken up with this, I'll be honest with you. I really, really am. It's dominated me for a couple of days here, actually. And so God the Father shall see the travail of his soul, verse 11, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And so God saw the travail of Christ's soul and was appeased for mankind. You know what the worst thing is? The word, it's not actually the worst thing. We say that as a preposition, but we don't really mean it. It's ex- literally the worst thing. But um, one of the worst things in life is this, is when you go through some suffering and you try to tell somebody about it and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, that reminds me when I suffered too. You know, I did this and that. And you're like, <sighs> somehow you're crestfallen in your soul. You're just like, they won't understand. They're not going to understand. Or they say, yeah, 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 but you know, uh, it's darker just before the dawn. It's going to get better. And you're like, they can't relate. They don't know what's going through. I've gone through several circumstances in my life, through several situations. We all have. There's nothing unique in that. Where nobody can relate. Nobody can relate to what you're going through. Nobody can relate. I looked for some to have pity on me, but there was no man that could have pity. And I was in one of these situations. And I was crying out to the Lord. And I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. And I was in a very solitary place. And as I cried out, cried out to the Lord, I assure you, as sure as I'm standing here this morning, he said to me, I know just how you feel. I know just how you feel. Oh, the, it melted me. I no longer had a need to have anyone else understand my dilemma. I no longer had a need for anyone else to understand my problem. Because I found someone who experienced the anguish of my soul. And interceded for me. And interceded for me. What a beautiful thing it is. What a beautiful thing it is that God, what God did for humanity. Not only allowed himself to suffer the injustice of a mock trial, but also allowed God the Father to bruise him and to bring anguish in his soul as an atonement for man. So that he could be the faithful high priest and intercede for us. This is the reason why, this is the reason why, folks, you know, a pastor mentioned earlier, you know, that many people over the last four or five decades have, uh, you know, gotten offended and gotten knocked off course. When you understand the anguish and the suffering and the injustices that Christ experienced and the knowledge that there will be injustices that we experience, then we know that we have a high priest that we can go to and share with them our injustices and he can say, I know how you feel and this is the remedy so that we can be healed and we can move on and be successful. I am not going to stand up here and tell you that I've never been offended in my life. I'm not going to tell you that. I will say this here that I do my best not to be offended but there are some times when you just need to go to the Lord and just say, 
this injustice. Look what's happening here. And if our hearts are listening, we'll hear him say, I know how you feel. I can help you with that. Let me intercede for you. Let me pray for you. Do you know what the, you know what the Lord's favorite title was, by the way? I'm, I'm going to ask for a response. Does anybody here know what the Lord's favorite title during his earthly ministry was? It's not a trick question, by the way. It'll be very obvious when I say it. <laughs> Son of Man. That was his favorite title. And I, I thought, well, I heard people say that before, but let me check and see. And what I found out was this. The term Son of Man is used by Jesus 80 times. By Jesus 80 times as a way to refer to himself. 80 times. Do you know how many times he used the phrase, of course, I'm asking a rhetorical question, sir, but uh, do you know how many times he used the phrase Son of God? Actually, when you look in the Scriptures, you find it's actually not really ever directly stated. In most cases, I looked up how many times the phrase Son of God was used, and it was about 46 times. And you know who was saying it? (laughs) The devil! The devil! (laughs) <laughs> and the devils and his, and his antagonists were saying it or other people said it but his favorite title was the son of man because the mission of God was to be clothed with his flesh to suffer the anguish of soul to experience physical pain to atone for the, man, uh, the sins of man and to be a faithful high pastor who can be easily touched with the feelings of our infirmities and be there to intercede for us as we go through the struggles of life. You find something to be challenging in your life, welcome to the club. We all do. The secret is finding the grace through His intercession. Not through guts and gristle, but falling before Him and saying, Oh God, this is more than I can bear. It's a challenge that's too tall for me. Intercede for me. And he promises that he will, according to the will of God, with groanings that can't be uttered. There would be nobody standing before the judgment seat in that day and say, you're the reason I failed. Because he intercedes. I have to bring this to a close. And get my spirit under control because I'm yelling again. Now, some of this is a little bit redundant, so I'm trying to shave it down just a little bit. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He has poured out his soul unto death for you. For me. You think he wants us to make it? You think he wants us to succeed? You know, pastor gives an exhortation this morning about, you know, getting back to full services. Well, this is one of the reasons why. Because he's worthy. I mean, church isn't just about us. It is a place for us to meet with God, but church is a place where we worship and serve him. He is the priority. And so Jesus Christ preferred to be called the Son of Man. Eighty times he refers to himself as the Son of Man. And so the true spirit of intercession, for anybody that's interceded uh, for another or for a nation or for something God laid on their heart, uh, they'll understand that intercession involves suffering. And I believe in the days that come that are coming, God is going to be calling many of us to intercession. You know, the suffering in the soul, the weeping, the anguish, that God's will might be accomplished. Well, that's what God does for us. That's what our faithful high priest does for that for us. And I, I want to, again, as I mentioned, I want to bring it to a close. And anyone who knows me knows I usually close two or three times. So we're, we're on the second closure here now. All right. I'm working on it, Pastor. <laughs> I, want to, I want to just state this here. 
that, as I mentioned earlier, his intercession isn't just for groups of people. While it is certainly for the church on the whole, we know that in Jesus' prayer, I pray for, you know, my disciples and I pray for the church so forth. But Jesus' intercession is very personal. Are you going through a struggle right now? Guess what? He knows all about the struggle and he's already began to pray. And uh, as we mentioned in the life of Peter, in Luke chapter 22 and beginning in verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now let me explain to you what this means. Jesus recognized that Satan wanted to snuff out the light that was in Peter. He wanted him to either be overcome with grief and fail and give up, or he wanted him to become offended, or in some fashion, Satan wanted to snuff the light out in Peter. And so what does Jesus say in verse 32? He said, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. That's an extraordinary statement there. Jesus is about to face the cross. And yet, he's praying. And so let's not consider this prayer as a prayer for everyone, everywhere, at once. Let's consider this here. And, I, and I've seen this, by the way. I've seen this. Uh, you know, in vision, I've seen this. Uh, a saint in their prayer closet praying and the Lord, you know, kneeling beside them, praying with them. That's a very real thing. That's a very real thing. And so Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18 says this, For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is also Able, he is able to succor them that are tempted. And so, my third conclusion. This is the final one. And so where are we at today, folks? As has already been mentioned this morning, we are living in an upside-down world. Backwards, 180 degrees out of phase. Where are we at right now? Do we feel overwhelmed? Do we feel anguish? Do we feel fear and anxiety? It should be a comfort to us this morning to know that He is ever interceding for us, praying for us. And you know what? Why not take advantage of that? Why not take advantage of that? Why not in your prayer closet, when you find it difficult to formulate the prayer, you find it difficult to put in words, why not simply say, I call upon the intersection of Christ. I call upon your intercession, Lord. Let me be comforted in the knowledge that you will pray for me with groanings that cannot be uttered according to the will of the Father. Amen.